วัสดีครับผมชื่อแอนดรูสตอร์ทส์ทุกวันนี้ผมอยู่ที่จะพูดกับคุณเกี่ยวกับ the AWS strategy and since it's just you and me I don't need this here I am in the phenomena studios and I'm going to talk to you about the all weather strategy and I'm going to try to take questions about what's happening globally all around the world and what are some ideas about investing So why don't we get started? And I'm going to go through some PowerPoint presentation. But if you got questions, make sure to ask them on the Facebook, ask them in the uh, on uh, YouTube, at any place that you're watching this on. Feel free to ask. So let's get started. How about that? I'm going to start off by going to my PowerPoint presentation. So my PowerPoint is going to explain about. The all-weather strategy. Let's go through that a little bit. Remember, the all-weather strategy is global, long-term, and diversified. If you're the type of person that's looking for short-term returns, this isn't the place. Now, let's look at it in more detail. First of all, we're just celebrating one year of partnering with Phenomena, and we're grateful for all of our investors out there who have trusted this strategy. We provide this strategy to the investment team at Phenomena, and then they provide it to you. So this is obviously what we call a guru port. Let's go through the strategy so far. What you can see here is the AWS strategy is the blue line. If you started the strategy one year ago with us, you would be seeing that you have lost money even after fees. You've lost about four percent, and the downside though has been reduced. Pretty significantly compared to the overall market, you can see the red line is what's called MSCI World. That means all stocks in the world. So, let's go through what we're going to talk about today. First, I'm going to talk about what we're facing related to COVID. I'm going to talk about more fear and some of the main themes that I see. I'm going to talk about how low can the U.S. market go. I'm going to talk about QE and will QE help us out of this situation. Somebody asked me the question, "Why did gold fall?" I thought gold was a hedge. I'm going to talk about gold, and then what's unique about our A Stocks All Weather Strategy? Also, how has it performed? We'll go through that, and what should I expect? Let's start off with what we're facing. So let's look at that. I was looking at a friend of mine. Uh, he posted this on his uh, on his Instagram, and it basically said, "I can't even get outside to do yard work without Corona." There's Corona bottle. Now, let's look at what we're faced with. Humanity, the whole world, is faced with a balancing act between COVID death. Most people are in their homes right now, thinking they're going to die from COVID, and economic suicide if nobody works. Right now, we have a situation of maximum fear. Governments and people here in Thailand were locked down. Everybody is at their homes, and generally, nobody's going out except for only necessary things. And that means also that people are dealing with their fear. But the problem is, is that when you stop an economy completely, you end up with the risk of economic suicide. Now, eventually, the COVID, the fear of dying of COVID, is going to change, and eventually, it's going to go up. And all of a sudden, people are going to think, "Oh my God, we've got to get the economy getting going again." Now, um, I saw some. I'm going to put up some things that I've seen out there. This is a, a, actually a, a friend of mine from uh, Ohio, and he said violence on the streets is going to be a bigger problem in the end than COVID. That's some people's idea. That was his idea at the time that he wrote that. Let's talk about some themes that we're going to be seeing. The first theme is fear. Are you afraid? Most people are afraid right now. It's a time of panic. It's a time of distrust of others. Who knows who has the virus? It's a time of increased blaming. It's a time of hoarding and threatening. Here we can see a recent news report on the 29th of March that you can see that basically police had to hold off people from breaking into a supermarket to get money uh, to get uh, food in Italy, and this is a issue that we're going to see. As I said, we have to eat. Is what this these people said when they were looting the supermarkets. Majority of people around the world don't have a lot of savings, and if they've lost their job, they're going to be out of money very fast. Now, of course, governments can try to close that gap, but the reality is, is that if you look at the World Health Organization, well, it wasn't a great warning. If you look at the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in America, they didn't 
putting out a lot of tests. The FDA isn't going to cure us through some uh, remedy. And FEMA, which is an organization in America to try to handle emergency, isn't going to feed people. So save yourself. This is from Nassim Talib, one of the most famous uh, guys who talks about risk. Here's another guy, Bill Mitchell, who asked the question, do we just shut down America every time a new virus comes along? You know, remember there was MERS and there was SARS before. They killed hundreds of thousands of people, and yet we still didn't have this kind of panic and fear. Now let's talk about the next theme, which is localization. Well, we were in a global world. Everything was global, but look at it now. Borders are closed. It was only a year ago that we would see that refugees were able to get across borders, let's say in Europe, pretty easily, but now those borders are closed. Some countries, maybe Turkey or Syria or others, may have refugee problems and issues, and they may use those refugees as a weapon. Also, governments are focused on taking care of their own citizens, and the value of the local supply chain grows. What's your local supply chain? Here is mine on my soy, that's Sukhumvit Soy 12, and they're up at four in the morning working on their supply chain and getting our food out. So, as this one said, end of globalization? Yep, I think it, there is a huge impact that this is gonna have. It could be how globalization ends. Here's another one from, uh, from Talib, Talib, and he's basically saying that in the old days, they blocked off towns in Europe to protect them. Here's another one, the end of globalization. I think it's very true that there is a strike against globalization now. The, the third theme that I see is debt. Well, first of all, debt got us into this problem. And I want to talk for a moment to the camera. And I want to just talk for a second to tell you about what I'm thinking about this concept of debt. It's very important that we realize that we just went through a period of a decade of almost 0% interest rates. Everybody knew that was abnormal and really shouldn't have been. It's important that we know that interest rates are a tool, they're a pricing mechanism, and they price risk. But when they're pushed down to zero, the pricing mechanism of interest rates just doesn't work. Now, what you're seeing in the corporate bond market, for instance, is the pricing of risk has now gotten much higher. Now, the government, particularly the U.S. government, can keep the cost of the interest rate down on the government funds. But the reality is, is that eventually the cost, the interest rates can't be uh, held back forever. We don't control the price of mobile phones, of computers, of many things. So why is it that we're so convinced that the Fed, particularly in the U.S., knows how to control interest rates? And eventually what's happened is the system has broken. Let's look at debt a little bit more. So here you can see government debt burdens are exploding. And eventually that's going to cause currency problems. In fact, you can think about it. For the U.S., it's a scarcity of dollars. So people are buying U.S. dollars right now. But there will come a time when they've increased the money supply so much that it's going to cause the value of the dollar to eventually fall. But what about countries like Thailand and others? If they want to raise money out in the markets, they're going to have to pay a high price. So it's easy for the U.S. to inject unlimited QE, but it's not so easy for other countries, and they may feel it in their currencies. Also, government support will naturally favor big businesses big businesses seem to always win. It's the small guy that gets crushed. Also expect debt wars. It's very possible that some countries will refuse to pay others and this can cause a huge escalation. And then now also in this chart, if you look at the gray area of this chart, you can see that the triple B rated bonds, there's a huge amount of high risk bonds outstanding. And those bonds are the ones that are getting priced up. The rates on those bonds are rising massively. Now, Moody's cut the outlook on $6.6 trillion of U.S. corporate debt. The outlook on every debt instrument has to be questioned now because companies may not be able to pay back. Also, here we can see that uh, UNCTAD has urgently called for $2.5 trillion aid package for developing countries. This is an important point. The developed countries like the U.S., as an example, have the power of the currency, have the power of the military, have the power of the government. But smaller and more developing countries just don't have this power. So this, this can hit us hard. Here we can see that $2 trillion, this is a representative in the U.S. Congress, and he's the only representative that, that wanted to demand that everybody vote on this in the House of Representatives on the bill. What he said is 
$2 trillion Congress plus $2 trillion for the Fed and the Treasury, that's $6 trillion stimulus. That's divided by 350 citizens in the U.S. It's $17,000 in debt, basically, per person, right? Times a family of four, 68000 it's not a great deal because eventually the dollar's going to fall. But what are you going to do? That's the problem that we're facing. So we've looked at some of these trends. Now it's time to ask the question, how low can the U.S. stock market go? Now, please ask any questions that you may have as I'm talking. The team here is going to provide those questions to me and I'll do my best to answer them. But here is a question that I just got, which is, is this crisis going to be worse than the previous crisis? And what is your strategy to deal with it? Good question. Is it going to be worse than the previous crisis? The answer to that is yes and no. Well, yes in one way. And that is that it's massive and it's hitting the whole world. No in the sense that once we get past the peak of the infection rate, we'll see that there will be a dramatic recovery. So it's a yes and no, but let's look at that in a little bit more detail. I'm going to go through some charts here and I want to look at the last three booms and busts in the U.S. stock market because that's really what I think we've got to worry about before we look at Thailand or other markets. First there was Black Monday in 1987, then there was the dot-com bubble, and then there was the global financial crisis. So let's take a look at these in a little bit more detail. I did a study to try to ask the question, how many days from start to peak and from peak to trough? And what you can see is on average, it was a thousand days from start to peak and it was 500 days from peak to trough. That's why we say in the markets that the stock market takes the stairs up and the elevator down. <laughs> Sometimes it falls down the elevator shaft. Now let's look at the next thing, which is what about the price, the index, the S&P index, that type of index, what happened? What we can see here is that if we look at so before we look at that, let's just look at the number of days of the rise. Here we can see that the number of days of rise was not 1,031. It was 3,999 days. That is a massively long run, fueled by what? Very low interest rates and towards the end, tax cuts. That 3,999 shows us that it was a very long bull run and that's a big difference. But we can't I can't come up with any good relationship between the length of the boom and the length of the bust. So let's just use the average days, which is 500 days. The peak of this, uh, of this boom was February 19th, 2020. And today, we're now 43 days later. 500 days would be July of 2021 that we would hit the bottom if we followed the past patterns. Next, let's look at the index. The index is the U.S. market, again, the S&P. And what we can see is on average, it rose 77% in the last three bull markets, and it fell 44% from peak to trough. Now, what did it do in this one? You can see here, 382% rise, a massive rise compared to prior booms. And of course, this rise was driven by almost 0% interest rates and tax cuts at the end. So. The positives are the market rise has been cemented by 5,000 or 4,000 days of company performance. Maybe the companies are stronger and better. The downside is, hey, the higher the rise, the larger the fall. And remember that it's fueled by tax cuts and near 0% interest rates. And these things were like uh, almost like giving drugs to a drug addict, let's say a heroin addict, just giving them more and more and more heroin and someday that addict is going to really crash. So I would say that the scenarios that I'm looking at is best case, we fall 40% from the peak. Base case, I'm expecting is 60% and worst case is 80%. So let's look at the last thing and that is the price to book ratio. If you look at the bottom of this chart, you can see that the price to book ratio in the 2007 crisis went from 2.6 to three times. That was a 15% re-rating. On average, there's been a re-rating of price to book of about 36% and a D-rating of 48%. So what about this one? Well, what we can see here is the re-rating re went up. In other words, the price to book multiple went up by 151. How much will it crash? 40%, 50%? I would stick with my scenario of 
best case minus 40, base case minus 60, and worst case minus 80. Now remember, I'm talking about the US stock market. I'm not talking about the Thai stock market, the Chinese stock market, I'm talking about the US. The US is the one that uniquely went through this boom and they are possibly going to pay the price. So let's review the negatives that we can see. It's a massive rise in the market. It could lead to a massive fall. The patient, meaning the stock market in the US, is already overdosed on low interest which was the medicine. There's also a serious slowdown in the underlying economy. We're talking about massive unemployment. There's risk to the currencies as governments are printing money. Eventually, there could be a risk to the US dollar. Disruptions in supply chains could cause panic where they're not delivering food. In fact, I just talked to someone in America that said that they went to the supermarket and they couldn't, they, want, they had to wait in line and once they got in there, it was empty. The supply chains actually in Thailand are very strong. And because a lot of people left Bangkok and went back up country to their homes, it took a lot of pressure off the Bangkok uh, supply chain system. And that, that's a saving grace for Thailand. Um, and then there's unexpected li liquidity events which can cause panic. That means a bank has a hard time paying back its depositors as an example. All right, let's look at the positives because, hey, there's always some positives. Well, companies are stronger than the past. They can adapt quickly. Another one is monetary and fiscal response by the governments has been massive and maybe it could prevent the worst from happening. And then this exponential rise in COVID infections across the world, country by country, it's oftentimes driven by the testing. As more and more people are tested and it's gotten control of, we'll see that that exponential rise will start to fall and people will get some more optimism. And of course, people will adapt and rebuild like after every crisis. So here's what we can see about the rally. The brown line in this chart shows that the rally was 3,999 days and it was massive. And there is my best base and my worst case that you can see. And there's a lot of downside left in the US market unless something turns around. So let's ask the question, does QE help us out of this situation? QE being US government quantitative easing. U.S. government quantitative easing basically means the U.S. government injecting money into the underlying economy. And by injecting that money and getting money flowing through the economy, it should have a positive impact. Well, one way of trying to understand the impact of QE is to look at a chart. And this chart is about the stock market in the U.S. and ask the question, what happened when QE was being announced? So let's go to that chart. Here you can see the chart. And... What you can see, I'm going to go through on the right side. On March 3rd, emergency rate cut by 50 basis points. It put the market up a little bit, but then it went down. On March 11th, increased overnight purchases, 175 billion US dollars. Market was still falling. On the 12th, announced 1.5 trillion in open market purchases in the US, and the market rallied. But then on the 15th, they cut rates to zero, and the market continued to crash. The point is, is that it's very hard for me to see that the Fed intervention is going to save the day at this point. Now, let's look at another thing that we are faced with in the U.S. In the U.S., foreigners have been selling U.S. Treasury bonds. This chart shows you that at the peak in March of 2014, foreigners had ownership of about 34% of the Treasury bonds of the U.S. government. But now it's down to 28.9. And who wants to buy these bonds right now? We may have some flight to quality for these bonds, but eventually what we'll have is that the U.S. will eventually have to find a buyer. Who is the buyer? The buyer will be the Fed. Here we can see China and Japan. They were the main buyers. China has now gone down from 26% of the total treasuries outstanding were owned by China. That's now come down to 16%. And Japan went from 37% down to 17%. This has been a steady decline that's been happening over time. Now, let's look at debt. This is the U.S. debt to GDP. It's the U.S. government only, just the government. And basically what you can see is the points that I've marked on this chart. 1866 was the Civil War and debt went up a lot. World War II was the next one and debt went up a lot. World War II, or sorry, that was World War I. World War II is when debt went up massively. You can see it was up to 121 
percent of GDP. But soon after that, the economies roared back and debt went down as a percent of GDP. Then you had the Cold War where Ronald Reagan was pushing up the defense spending. And now you've had the war on terror that started in 19, after two, two uh, what is that? 9-11, uh, that's it, I forgot. So after 9-11, then it was a war on everybody, basically. And you can see that that caused it here. Here's my forecast of where the U.S. debt to GDP is going to go. And it's going to go up to about 180% is my expectation. How is that happening? Because trillions of dollars are being spent and borrowed by the U.S. government. But more importantly, also, the GDP is collapsing. And if GDP right now, Goldman Sachs has said that GDP could come down by 25 30%, we're talking about a massive rise in debt to GDP. Now, if we look at this chart, this, this is showing each country's uh, debt levels. Now, the red bar is the household debt. I want you to look at Thailand on this chart. Thailand is at 69% of GDP. It's got a pretty high level of corp or household debt, meaning individuals. And that's the problem. That's a problem for the government. That's a problem for the bank. But you can also see that 42% in Thailand is government debt. So government debt in Thailand is pretty small. Government has the capacity to borrow, but also remember, they're going to have to pay high interest rates, unlike the U.S. government. But what's significant here is that the U.S. is basically the one where there's going to be a lot more government borrowing. Now, Japan's already at 399% when you add up the companies and the individuals and the government. It's massive, but the U.S. could get there. This gives you a list of companies or countries where we can see that debt levels are high. Now, what's interesting is that almost all of the com companies that have high levels of debt are developed markets. In the emerging markets, most of them don't have that much debt on the government's balance sheet. Now, somebody asked me the question, why did gold fall? I thought it was a hedge. All right. So this is one of my guests actually on my podcast, Rao Pal. He asked, he said, gold is dangerous in a liquidity event, but priceless in an insolvency event. Meaning when there's no cash around, gold is very valuable. But the problem is, is that people have to sell gold initially to get cash. But as things start to improve, they want to hold gold. So right at the moment of the crisis, we tend to see that gold goes down, just like the market, because people are cashing that in to get dollars. So now, let's look at another one here. Uh, I'm going to go straight to this chart. Let's look at this chart. So here you can see. Here you can see the red line is gold. And gold fell during the period that the market fell gold fell also but the fall is much much less so we can never expect that gold is going to be completely uncorrelated when markets crash everything crashes so gold is never going to protect you in every single moment but over the long run it can protect you relative to the market now i think it's an important part that i would say about the strategy that we have which is the all-weather strategy is that it's an equity strategy that uses gold bonds and commodities just as a tool to try to reduce risk. So let me just go to the next chart. This chart shows, look at that red line. The red line is the level of correlation between gold and the stock market. And what you can see is there's almost no correlation. It's between 10, plus 10 and minus 10. It's a very low amount of correlation. And that means that on the, in the long run, gold can be an asset that we can use whenever we are really expensive in the stock market to hold more gold. So we consider it as a hedge, particularly when governments are printing money. All right, we've got a question. If you've got other questions, please feel free to type them in and send them in, and I'll try to answer them right now on air. Here's a question that I got, and that is, in your latest target weight update, why did you decide to increase the target weight of gold for just a little? You went from 25 to 30%. Why not increase it more? That's a tough question. You know, naturally we feel like in a moment of panic, try to run to something safe and make extreme moves. But what I've learned over the years is that extreme moves, particularly at times of panic, can be very dangerous for our wealth. So I want to show you a slide that helps you to understand the way I think. So there's three keys to my style. First is long term. 
It's based upon nearly 30 years of experience in the market. I started working in the stock market in 1992. So I've lived through the 97 crisis, the dot-com boom, the mortgage bust, and all of that. The second thing is that I have a highly structured framework. I'm a very structured and rules-based thinker. So I've built that framework over a long period of time, and then I have discipline to follow that framework. I'm not afraid to underperform or make to, to not have perfect performance during the time as long as I continue to follow that framework. So, to answer the question now that you understand my way of thinking, remember that no asset class has beaten stocks over the very long run. Stocks, meaning owning companies, is your best way of performing over a long period of time. And that's what the all-weather strategy is, a long-term strategy. When I'm talking long-term, I'm not talking five years. I'm talking 10, 20, 30, 40 years. That's my time frame for this fund. Stocks are the center of this portfolio. Companies ultimately in the long run will produce the highest return. The other asset classes that I have, like gold and other things, I'm not buying them to try to improve the upside, to try to improve the gains. I'm buying them to try to reduce the downside of just that equity. So the best way to think about this strategy is to say it's an equity strategy with other asset classes that are used to balance it out. Previously, we had set a limit for gold not to exceed about 25 to 30 percent in the whole portfolio. That's already a huge amount. If you look at an average mutual fund out there, there's no way if they could even hold gold, they wouldn't be able to hold more than maybe five, maximum 10 percent. And in normal times, the gold holding is going to come down to maybe 5%. So to answer the question, basically, I've tried to maintain the discipline of the all-weather strategy. Now, here's, a, here's something to think about. This is an article written by Mark Holbert. And he's a very famous guy in America because he studies newsletters. People who, every month, they come out with their recommendations and they recommend what to buy and what to sell. And he did a study, and this study he did in 2018. It's not, not related to this crisis. But the idea that he was trying to do is say, what percentage of newsletters that recommended gold actually outperformed or did better than just a buy and hold strategy? And here's what he found. What he found was none. The percent of monitored gold timers who beat a buy and hold strategy over trailing 20 years, zero, 30 years, zero, and even 10 years, zero. Gold is very hard to, to be in and out of, so I would be care careful about trying to go in and out. All right, now let's talk about what's unique about the all-weather strategy. The point is that we're trying to grow and protect long-term wealth with a balanced exposure. The strategy is well diversified across asset classes, and we want it to be able to fare well through various markets, various types of weather, and grow and protect long-term wealth with a balanced risk exposure. As I've said, there's three keys to my style of the way that I manage, and that is long-term perspective. I'm the wrong guy to be talking to if you want to know what's happening next week, but if you want to think about the next five or ten years, I'm good at that. I'm a highly structured guy. I put together a framework that is a strong investment framework. And then I'm a disciplined person and I follow that framework even though at times it's very painful and very discomforting to follow that framework. Now, we want to reduce the risk compared to an equity-only strategy. I mean, the best case, as, you said, as, as I said, Aunt, you said, you could say to me, Andrew, you said that equity is the best thing to own. If equity is the best thing to own, then why don't I just own all equity? Well, the point is, is that I'm trying to reduce some of the downside. The core of the all-weather strategy is always stocks, but we know that stocks have pretty massive downturns. So the aim is to capture as much of that upside from the stocks as we can, but also trying to reduce the risk on the downside. And so we're trying to, to manage that without too many changes to the portfolio. The objective is to reduce the worst drawdowns. Now, the next question, the next question, that I got is a tough question. And the question comes in and it says, I have a big loss from when I invested in AWS. Any suggestion on how I can adjust the portfolio's weight? The first thing I wanna say is, losing money is always painful. And I know that feeling very well. Nobody wants to lose money, 
But over time, if you're investing, you've got to accept the fact that you are going to lose. But if you play the game long enough, you are going to win. So now let's look at this situation. I'm going to look at this particular chart. This is AWS since the beginning of the year. What you can see is the blue bar shows that the AWS strategy since the beginning of the year throughout all this crisis is down 13%. That's painful. I wish that I could have switched all the money into gold and been up 5%, but that's just market timing. We could never get that. Now, if you were an investor in the US stock market, you'd be down 20%. If you were an investor in the set index, you'd be down 28%. So I have to say, say that even though we have, we have lost money in this strategy by 13% year to date, it's a lot less than if we had been in the Thai stock market as an example. So remember, the set has fallen by 28%. Remember that the AWS strategy is beyond the set, it's global. Also in the long term, losing less matters a lot. The people that lose a lot of money are the ones that tend to never able to get it back. AWS is diversified across asset classes. That means less loss than an equity only strategy. So to answer the question, I'm sorry about any loss, but we have to try to manage this over the long term. Now, remember also that AWS is not an absolute strategy. Losing is always painful, but cannot be completely avoided if you want to get the long term gains in the stock market. Our aim with AWS is to capture the high returns of investing in stocks, but have lower drawdowns than an equity only strategy. Okay, we got another question. And before I answer this question, let me just add one thing on to the last question. Somebody said, how should I adjust the strategy or the portfolio to make up for the loss? The point of the all weather strategy is I'm trying to adjust the strategy, provide that to the fund management team at Phenomena and then let them go through it and then help communicate that to the client. So my first advice is that follow the strategy. If you break the strategy, then you're not going to get the advantage of what I'm trying to do 24 seven, just like every other fund manager out there. We're all working the hardest that we can to try to do the, the best that we can. So, so the answer to that question really is, is it stick with the strategy, stay disciplined. So the next question is, should I reduce the investment exposure during this situation? Well, based on the factors that have historically worked best, markets are constantly evolving and as such strategies got to evolve. Therefore, we're continuously conducting research and I'm constantly working on the strategy and my objective is to do it as a set it and forget it so that you don't have to do that. Investing is a game for the long run, but must always, you've got to be always careful about making changes to a strategy when the short term conditions are brutal. Any modifications to our methodology are made after thorough research testing and careful consideration. Remember, global, long term and diversified is what we're going after with the all weather strategy. Global means we invest globally, not only in Thailand. Long term means gains from long term equity return while trying to reduce a portion of losses during equity market downturns. And diversified means diversified globally across four asset classes. So the strategy invests in four classes, asset classes, equities, bonds, commodities, and gold. The benefits are you're getting a global allocation beyond the Thai stock market. So what happens if the Thai stock market is down for the next five years? Also, you're gaining exposure to fast growth countries and sectors. You're also avoiding some home country bias. We all tend to invest where we are. The risk, of course, one major risk is that the bot strengthens over time. Now, here's my friend Kun Siriwat, and he struggled after the 97 crisis and he had to rebuild himself. I have a lot of respect for what he did over time. But the point is sometimes our own domestic markets could suffer a lot. And that's the reason why that uh, global is valuable. Now, let's talk about long term. We want to gain from long term equity, a strategy built around equity is what we've got and it's historically the best way to grow your wealth. No other asset class has outpaced inflation more than equity. Now throughout our backtesting period, equity exposure has averaged about 70% and it can range from when we're really pessimistic 25% and when we're really optimistic 85%. The testing also shows that the strategy lost significantly less in the past two major crises. 
So what's the benefits? Regularly investing in a long-term portfolio is the best way to build your wealth over time. Long-term investing removes the trouble of watching the market every day. Also, it can reduce stress. <laughs> Leave the stress to me. <laughs> Risks, even this long-term strategy could massively fall. Every strategy can fall. But also you could miss allocating your money into the next big sector or country or something. Some people they say, oh, I wanna be able to rotate. I wanna jump into Turkey stock market and then I wanna jump into the Russian stock market and then I wanna jump into the US stock market. That's hard. The last thing I wanna say about long-term is I actually built, I built this strategy around young kids. And I wrote my book, How to Start Building Your Wealth, Investing in the Stock Market, for young kids. Not just for any young kids, but for these five young kids in this picture. Who are they? Those five young kids are my five nieces. That's Hannah, Audrey, there's Elsie, and there's Sophie, and there's Kristen. I wrote the book to help them invest for the long term, and that's what they do. Now, for those who want a diversified portfolio, that's what we have. We are going across different asset classes to reduce risks. And also, we're reducing concentration in any particular country or sector. We're also reducing some equity risk by bending in bonds and commodities and gold. And that reduces the country risk by owning assets in each country. The benefits are you have reduced risk and that gives you more comfort. It allows investors to focus on creating wealth rather than growing it. It's less focused on trying to time the market and even the diversified strategy could fall massively. You could miss allocating your money again. You could say, oh, Andrew, I don't wanna do that. That strategy's so boring. What I wanna do is a really fancy strategy. Well, those are hard to implement and they don't always get it right. Remember that we create, grow, and protect our wealth. In fact, I do a podcast called My Worst Investment Ever and I've learned a lot from that podcast. I've interviewed more than 200 people and I've learned that you know to win in investing, you've got to take risks, but to win big, you've got to reduce them. I've identified six ways that people lose their money. First, they fail to do their research. The second is they fail to properly assess and manage risks. The third is that they're driven by emotion or flawed thinking. What about you? Have you made emotional or flawed thinking and decisions? This is very, very common. They've misplaced trust. They failed to monitor their investment. And we'll see right now that many people who started investing in startups will lose almost all of their money. It's, not, it's, it's a great way to become rich, but it's also a great way to lose all your money. So finally, let's go through how AWS has performed and what should you expect. So this question just came in, how do you manage the portfolio during this situation? How do you know that this is the best solution for investors? Well, basically I've tried to explain how I manage the portfolio but I don't know that this is the best solution for investors. It is a strategy that fits me and my personality, and that's why I've created it, and I've provided it to Phenomena. It may or may not fit you, and you've got to think about that you know, on your own. Now, what would be the portfolio adjustment from now on? Well, the fact is, is that I've made recent adjustments, and I'm going to go through those. I don't see any new adjustments coming from how it can go. So let's go into it. Right now, we're in very rough waters. The opening of 2020 has been very rough. It's not easy to sit still when the value of your portfolio falls massively in a day and then it bounces back in another day. With the all-weather strategy, you're going to gain from long-term exposure and we're trying to cushion that downside. So I'm going to show you our allocations that we started the portfolio with. When we started back in February of last year with Phenomena, we were actually very negative on equity. Remember that maximum equity exposure is about 85%. We were at 45, 25% bonds, 25% gold. In September 2019, we made some adjustment. We, we decided to get a little bit more positive on equity and we increased that by decreasing bonds. Also, we had seen bonds go down in yield, therefore up in price. We had made good gains. But then by March 4th, we switched back to 45% uh, in equity and back to bonds and then on the 24th of March, we had seen on the Friday before that there was a problem that, we were, that was being experienced in the Thai military uh, TMB asset management, one of the funds that had corporate bonds. And we knew that corporate bonds were under threat. And so we switched on the 24th out of that 
and we moved it all into government bonds. So, and then we also got out of the commodities. So you can see on the 25th, we made the final adjustments, which I don't expect it will make any adjustment from this point. That's 25% equity, very low, 45% bonds and 30% gold. And that's also no allocation right now to commodities. So next question, due to the situation of COVID in the US, QE, are S&P 500 and gold still attractive investments? Well, I would say that actually S&P 500 is not an attractive investment to me right now. I think that it's a possibility, as you've seen from my analysis, that the S&P 500 could fall by another 30, 40, 50%. It already was very high. It was pumped up by very low interest rates. And so the S&P, I would say, is not an attractive investment. And even though it will bounce back some days, I don't mind to miss some of that upside right now, as long as I also protect against the downside. Now, is gold attractive? I think gold will continue to be attractive as, as a hedge against that. Now, if you've, got, uh, if you've got questions, make sure that you've put them in. And if, I, if we have any other questions come in, feel free to let me know, and then I'll start to answer some of those questions. So for the moment, the safest, one of the adjustments I'll just talk about that tries to answer one of the questions I had which is, for the moment, the safest bond alternative for a Thai investor is short-term Thai government bonds. This is the risk-free asset in Thailand. To achieve that, we've shifted the bond allocation away from a mix of high-quality corporate and government bonds to straight government bonds. And that was the, the, the change that we made previously. Also, we've, previously we saw further downside from all-time high in equities, and so we moved equities down to 25%. The U.S. is the most overvalued market, and so we've decreased U.S. exposure to five. Again, we have rules and we have a structure that we follow, and that's the reason why we don't go to zero. Bond allocation now is at 45. That is a very high amount of exposure to bonds. As far as commodities are concerned, this is not something that I'm going to play around with at this point because I think we have to wait for some recovery. Now, oil price is crashing and then bouncing back. It's a little bit more of a political football. But I would say that for right now, I'm comfortable to have zero weighting in commodities. And finally, we've increased the weighting in gold slightly. So here is the result of what we can see. In March 2020, everything fell, but the all-weather strategy lost less than if you were just owning the U.S. or the world market. And what we can see is that it outperformed the world equity by 4.5. Now, nobody can sit there and say, hey, we lost 8.9%. We outperformed. Losing sucks. Liquidity needs, uh, you know, liquidity needs in the market has caused gold to fall. It's been negative. But also we see that we have some liquidity in bonds and that's pushing it down. But that brings us back to where we started this whole presentation. And that is to say that basically right now we've averaged about 45 to 65 percent in equity. And now we are down to 25 percent in equity. The downside has been reduced. And since inception, AWS has had about half the volatility of the world market. You can see that blue bar in this chart shows the volatility of the AWS portfolio to be 11.6. And that compares to if you were just owning either US or world, if you were just owning those, you would have had at least a double, almost a triple volatility. So that's part of what we're going after. The last thing that I would talk about is the downside. Here in this chart, I've looked at the 10 worst days. And from this, you can see that the worst day was the 12th of March. And the overall market was down by 9.5%, but the AWS portfolio was down by 4.3%. That's the objective of what we're trying to do, is reduce the loss. And that is the key, key thing about the AWS strategy. So for right now, I'm going to stop at that point, and I'm going to ask if we have any questions. Let's see, any questions? All right, Sukit, he says, is it the appropriate time to increase money into the port right now? I think the, the answer to that question is, uh, we've recently done a study on dollar cost averaging. And maybe, Sukit, let's, let me walk you through this for a moment. I'm gonna show you some work that I recently did. We did it actually, we finished it this morning. 
And it has to do with dollar cost averaging in AWS. So take a look at this, Sukit. What I want you to look at is that what if you had put your money in at the peak of the market? If you'd put your money in the peak of the booms of World War I, the Great Depression, the dot-com, the global financial crisis, if you'd put your money in then, then you would have gotten either a 31%, a 62%, an 11% negative, or a 4% positive five years on. But if you had done dollar cost averaging, you would have always beaten the point of putting in money at the peak. Now, the point is, is that nobody can, call, can, talk, can uh, call the market right. What I would suggest is that you think about putting your money into the fund consistently over a long period of time. Don't try to do it all at once. So the answer to your question is, I feel comfortable saying, continue to put money into it, but don't put all of your money into it. Allocate a small amount every single month and build up. All right, long bull, short bear. What will happen? What will happen if China sells all bonds in the U.S. while U.S. is injecting QE? Well, it's going to be a difficult. I think it's a, it's a good question, long bull, short bear. <laughs> cool name. So um, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, it's part of what I worry about is debt wars, where the U.S. decides that it won't pay back its debts that it owes China. I think that there's a risk of that. And I think the result of that is that China does not want to aggressively sell its position. So the, the answer to that is, I don't think that the China is going to try to sell out its whole position. They're going to try to slowly do it. Now, the point that you may be thinking about is that if China's not buying U.S. bonds, who's buying it? If nobody's buying U.S. government bonds, then what's going to happen? The U.S. government's going to have to raise interest rates, and that's going to be a killer. So that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is the Fed is going to take the place of China and Japan and others, and they're going to buy all of the bonds uh, that the U.S. issues for right now. So that's what I think is going to happen in that case. The Fed is the buyer of last resort, and that will keep the interest rates down. All right, we've got another one. Chakrat. All right. Gold versus Bitcoin. Which one is better? <laughs> that's a difficult question. Uh, I would say that it depends on what your goal is. I think Bitcoin is an interesting one. As a, as a valuation expert, I would say it's very hard for me to come up with a, a, a valuation of Bitcoin. I really can't tell you what I think it's worth. But it does seem like there's value there. I would say that in my case, I would look at Bitcoin and maybe 5% of your wealth, maximum maybe 10. Put it in Bitcoin and let's see what happens over the next 10 or 20 years. And you could be a super ultra rich person. Gold is something very different. You can see a lot more stability in gold. It's not le the level of volatility is not the same. So in that case, I would say that gold is not uh, the same as Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not somewhat of a store of value. It is more of a speculative investment that may become more and more valuable over time. All right. Okay. So we have Damilari Gijian Ojo. Good day, Andrew. I'm Gijian, joining from Nigeria. How can I invest using the AWS from Nigeria? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't think we can do it yet in Nigeria, but you can join my upcoming course that I have, which is called How to Start Building Your Wealth Investing in the Stock Market. I have that course online already, but and you can contact me uh, f about that. But as far as implementing that, I only have looked at different markets like China and Thailand and the US for implementing it. So over time, we're going to get to Nigeria. All right. Any other questions? All right. Poor Bloom. Uh, do you think that in the future China may sell all of its U.S. government in order to devalue the dollar? I, I personally, you may think I'm crazy, but I, I don't think that China wants war with America. I don't believe that China thinks that they will benefit from that. And basically, if they start taking active steps to devalue, to try to sell the dollar, to devalue it, then, you know, it's, it's something that they know will bring the wrath of the U.S. military and the U.S. government onto them, and I don't think that they want that. So I would suspect that China's stuck. They've, they've reduced their holdings of U.S. dollars from 26% down to about 16%, and I suspect that they'll reduce that slowly over time. And what are they going to put the money in? Gold, oil, things like that. All right. 
Another one. Do you think that in the future, okay, uh, let's see. Which country do you think where the stock market will be the fastest to recover after COVID? Well, I think that, um, I don't think that it's going to be the U.S. And one of the reasons is because I believe that the U.S. is just too expensive and has been fed by low interest rates and, uh, and, and tax cuts. And I think with all the spending, it's going to be hard. Now, also, one of the things that's interesting is that when oil prices went extremely low, that's beneficial for emerging markets. Thailand, India, these countries are major importers, China, of, of oil. So these countries would have benefited massively from a low oil price. But already what you can see is that the U.S. is trying to get the oil price up. And by doing that, try to save their shale, shale oil producers. But in the end, that's going to hurt the rest of, of the world. But I would say, you know, look at China right now. There's a market that is starting to recover. Look at Korea, starting to recover. I would say that Thailand, to me, is, an, is a market that has a lot of opportunity. Thailand has been spared. I've looked at some charts about COVID that look at the latitude, and it's shown that countries that are below a certain level of latitude, meaning they're in the southern hemisphere and it's very hot, have not had as many deaths as far as COVID. Is it causal? Is it a valid relationship? Time will tell. There's one country, Philippines, that has had a, reasonable, a high, reasonably high amount of uh, COVID deaths. But if you look at that, I've also done some work recently to correlate obesity, to correlate heart disease, to correlate cancer and other uh, illnesses. And what you can see is that where a country has a lot of these illnesses, that it tends to have a higher death rate. Not always. There's many different factors. So I would say, make sure you're keeping yourself healthy. I've already lost like four kilos in this crisis. I eat one major excellent meal at lunch and then that's it for my days. All right, next. What would be the QE? What could go wrong? Can we all be doomed because of too much QE? So what can go wrong with QE? I think that you know the problem that we're going to face is that the government can't bail out everybody. And we know, particularly whenever governments step in, there's all kinds of unintended consequences. Why should any employer pay when the government's going to pay the wages? There's all kinds of messed up things. Why should somebody pay uh, their landlord if the government's providing support, all of these things. So I think the QE provides a massive amount of moral hazard when the government comes in. And what I'm talking about is government support. It can cause huge amounts of moral hazard. It also tends to benefit the big businesses. Small businesses are crushed. I think you, you have the risk in, in the U.S. in particular that you're going to have riots and other things coming up in major cities over time. But the last part about QE and what could go wrong with QE is that eventually the dollar will devalue. Not now. There's a shortage of dollars and many people are, have money into the US dollar. And so dollar has been strong, but eventually I believe that the, the main damage from QE, particularly in the West, will be that the dollar will get weak. Let's look at Thailand and QE. Can Thailand afford QE like that? Where would Thailand get the money? Thailand would have to borrow money to inject into the economy. If the Thai government goes out to borrow money from the people, well, the people don't have a lot of money right now. They're not necessarily willing to give that much money. They go outside of Thailand, they're going to have to pay a very high interest rate. It's much more complicated for the developing countries around the world. And that, that's because they can't just print money like the U.S. The reason why the U.S. money can print money is because it's the reserve currency. It controls the banking system. It controls the global financial system. And it uses that power to protect the currency. So... Those are some issues. Let's look at some more, right? Who is that? Can somebody, uh, let's say, can you please explain why you choose S&P over the NASDAQ? Because I think that NASDAQ has been diversified and can lead to higher income than S&P 500. Yeah, it's a difficult uh, issue. If it was up to me and, and you implemented this strategy, my, my course and my book called How to Start Building Your Wealth, Investing in the Stock Market basically says that if you can buy all stocks in the world, why not own that? Or in the US, what about all stocks in the US? I'd rather not actually make a lot of decisions about whether to own S&P 500, NASDAQ, or small cap, large cap, or anything like that. I would just like to have broad-based exposure to the US market. But the problem is, is that the AWS portfolio has to be executed through mutual funds. And because we execute through mutual funds, I've got to look at all the different mutual fund options available in Thailand and then find the one that I think is suitable. 
and the S&P 1 is suitable. Also remember, I'm trying to reduce the cost, the fees. So I'm trying, if I have two mutual funds and they're somewhat similar, and one's at a lower cost, I'm gonna choose that one. So the reality is, is that I don't have a lot of choice in that case, but I, I don't think I would go so narrow as to go to the NASDAQ because as you say, the NASDAQ may have produced good performance in the past, but what's to say that the NASDAQ doesn't just crash in the future? So the reality is I'd rather own the NASDAQ and the S&P all together in the U.S. All right, uh, next one. Is it possible for QE, uh, let's see, is it possible for QE to be effective in areas under strict COVID measures and shutdowns? Uh, well, QE, QE works because it's injecting money into the money supply. The problem during uh, shutdowns is that the whole economy stopped. So QE doesn't necessarily really help a lot in that situation. It's trying to put liquidity, but the reality is that the whole supply chains have stopped. For those people that know me, they know that I have a, a factory, a coffee business, and we have accounts payable and accounts receivable, and, and it's all stopped. So even though you may inject money, QE is an injection ultimately of money uh, from the government, it doesn't necessarily solve a situation where you've stopped all business. The second question of that is, given the economic recession, what advice can you give to young finance professionals or fresh grads who are supposed to start their careers this year? Well, I've got good and bad news for you if you're starting your careers this year. The bad news is it's just going to be harder to get a job right now and you're going to have to accept a lower salary. The good news is that if you can start investing just a small amount of your salary, you'll probably be investing at a pretty low level. The main lesson that you should learn from this, number one, keep your, <clears throat> keep your spending deeply below your income. Keep your spending deeply below your income. The difference of that is the value that you have. All right. Um, and next one, at what point can you say that the global economy has certainly hit bottom? What determinants can we consider in estimating how long the crisis can last? <clears throat> it's important to remember that uh, the economy is different from the stock market. Sometimes we have to wait a long time for the economy to bottom out, but the stock market may say, hey, we're hitting the bottom now, and therefore I'm ready to get, uh, you know, the stock market can, can come back up. So I would say that basically, there's going to be some crises that are unintended consequences of the situation. You can't shut down. L look at the U.S. as an example. The unemployment rate was 3%, and all of a sudden it's just doubled to 6% with more than 3 million people out of work, <clears throat> and now it's just gone up to uh, about 10 million people out of work. And there's estimates, and I wouldn't doubt it at this point if things go the way they are, that you could have 50 million people out of a workforce of 160 million people in the U.S., you could have 50 million people out of work. That level, that's a third of the workforce out of work. How can any economy sustain that? And I would argue that it's nice to think that the economy will shoot back up, but the reality is, is that no economy can recover that fast from this. So on the one hand, share prices may start to bounce back, but ultimately earnings of the companies will take time. Also remember that there is the uh, the desire to consume has been crushed. People are terrified about spending. Okay, uh, what situation that you'd increase proportion of risky assets? <clears throat> well, I'm, 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 I reevaluate the strategy every three months and occasionally in between I look at it. But generally I would say you're probably looking for a deeper fall in the U.S. market by another 20, 30, 40% fall in the U.S. market. And then where would you put your money? I would say that Asia probably is pretty attractive. Asia has already gone through the wave of COVID and is going to be ahead. In addition, a lot of countries in Asia have young people that are not going to be affected by the COVID, you know, to the extent that older people like in Italy, it's a lot, many, many more older people there. And so I would say that you're going to see that Asia probably would be the place to get some exposure over the next couple of months. Uh, next one, if we face a global recession and in such a situation, many of the manufacturing uh, companies will lose business and some are already closing, considering the impact it will bring on the livelihood of poor laborers, how do you think the companies may come back with a new funding strategy to pay off the basic salary? Okay, so this is the problem. <clears throat> we have in some ways a new class warfare. Communism was ultimately a class warfare system. 
And the class warfare was the laborers, the working class, against the owners of the capital. But nowadays, you have a class that's in between that, and that is what I call the Zoom or the Skype class. The Zoom or the Skype class are the ones that are posting pictures on Instagram about their cool office that they set up at home. And it's awesome, and they can work from home. Those people are not being hit as hard right now as the laborers who lose their job right away. Now, governments are trying to help, but how much can the government help? Eventually, the Skype and the Zoom class, I believe, will take a major hit. And they're not prepared for that. And when that happens, then they'll be saying, we probably need to go back to work. But for right now, unfortunately, the laborers are going to suffer. And how, when governments force businesses to shut down, how can businesses pay laborers? Normally, there's severance pay and other things. It's harder for laborers to get that. So I think that it's ultimately, if you shut down the economies the way that we do, we have to accept the fact that it's going to push. Think about a husband and wife, a young couple. Maybe they're not highly educated, but they were making good money and they got a chance to put their child into university. It took everything they had. But now they've been knocked back, their child's going to come out. You've got a whole class of people that could take a hit that could last five or ten years. I just looked at a study, and you can look for it online. It said that it attributed 500,000 deaths to the last crisis in the OECD nations, meaning the largest countries. That research was fascinating, and they tried to tease out the deaths that were happening and try to see if, there's, if you could strip out all other factors. And they found that many people in particular died of cancer. That's not to consider suicides and other things. But because they, stress levels were high, immunity is weak, and also they couldn't afford the treatments. So it's very tough. Uh, next question, what is the most sensible thing to do between bailing out or letting businesses fail? Uh, back in 2008, 2008, many people said that the government should have let the banks fail instead of bailing them out, but it's happening even more now than back then. Though we could see that without the government stepping in, a lot of small businesses... Okay, so the point is, um, from your video yesterday, it's not hard to imagine that a few defaults could spark even worse crisis. You know, it's the hardest part about this situation is that the government's fed cheap money to businesses and banks and consumers. And they did it for a decade in cleaning up from the last crisis. They didn't let any banks fail. And the result of that is that we're back where we are. And I would argue at this point that uh, you've got two problems. The problem that that created by having interest rates so low and pumping up the economy and the markets, the COVID just picked, it was the pin that pricked the bubble. And now we're trying to clean up from that. I would say that from my perspective, you're really stuck at this point because uh, that caused such a problem, a distortion. Interest rates should have been very high in the past, particularly for country, companies that were high risk or governments that were high risk. <clears throat> but every interest rate was kept down. So you've already caused a serious problem. Now, the question is, do you let banks go bust right now? Is, it's too difficult right now. Unfortunately, they're probably going to have to. You, know, you can imagine. Banks are struggling right now. People aren't paying back their interest. They're not getting the income that they normally get. I'm sure they're getting some support from the government. Uh, the problem is, you know, was this a bank failure? In some ways, you could say it was a government failure in my, protect, my, my idea. There's more that I can say about that, but I'd stop at that point. Uh, how can I change portfolio strategy when I use DCA method? So the idea is that uh, with DCA method, you're going to go to phenomena, set your amount, execute that, tell them, I want to execute that. The investment committee will help you to execute that with DCA and then follow the weightings that Phenomena provides you. Apirak Chot Jaruchaya. Long term equals 40 years. Oh my God. Hey, 40 years from now, I'm going to be 95. Still going to be around. That's not too long. We tune. What will be happening in the future if we can, if can do, if we can do unlimited QE all the time? Can these crises be solved the same as in the past? I think that people are going to figure out and alternative currencies are going to be coming up. And as we've already seen in Bitcoin and other things, I think that basically over time what we're going to see is that governments, people are figuring out that governments can't prop up markets forever. And they'll see that it was a big, uh, 
Maybe it was a fake rally that we just had for 4,000 days. Um, will AWS call to sell all T TMB, TM like phenomena? Uh, well, AWS is a strategy. As an advisor, I provide it to phenomena. So ultimately, Phenomena's investment committee is communicating to you, the client, about the strategy. I would say that what happened with Thai military TMB asset management was specifically about some corporate bonds in the US and the risks there. I would say that TMB asset management overall doesn't have a problem. And in fact, asset management companies are different from, let's say, a bank. With an asset management company, your money is actually in a vehicle. The asset management company doesn't have the ability to access that money except to buy, sell, and follow your instruction. So in that way, the SEC in Thailand has done a very good job, along with SECs around the region, to try to make sure that your money is protected in there. So generally, I would say there's not a, a problem with asset management companies. Jan, there's my friend Jan. He studied with me at the USTC. Yeah, Jan. Uh, U.S. will devalue due to QE, but how about the other major currencies? Are other major currencies such as the euro heading into big trouble? This is the problem. The problem that we face right now is that, um, <clears throat> is that every country is in trouble. Every country is printing money. Every country is trying to do QE. It's part of the reason why the dollar is strong right now. But eventually what's going to happen is that the countries that, that didn't have, like take New Zealand. New Zealand has a small amount of government debt. Yeah, they may print money, they may inject money into the economy, but it's going to have a small impact. So their currency will stay strong. But other currencies, such as the euro and the dollar, they're going to go down. But, but the problem is when the dollar goes down, it's almost against every other currency. So yes, other countries are going to be facing this same problem. It's a difficult call on that one. Uh, Tana Bodhi, how many Thailand QEs which you think for COVID crisis? What's your view on whether there will be an ETF crisis? Um, I don't think there's an ETF crisis. So far, ETFs have survived this liquidity situation. And I would say that ETFs to me are not a major crisis. Now, I could be wrong. I, I, I haven't studied it in, in a huge amount of detail, but from what I've studied about ETFs, I'd say if they can survive this so far, they'll be fine. Um, how much QE can Thailand do? I think Thailand has a limited amount of power with that. On the one hand, the Thai government has a small amount of government debt. That's good. But on the other hand, to borrow money from other countries outside and inject that money in, it's just going to be very hard. All right. Uh, what is your view? Okay, uh, next one. Is this kind of crisis could lead to so-called Great Depression? A lot of people are now thinking that this is a possibility. Or we'd like to have a Great Depression. This is an important question. The answer is that during the Great Depression, the stock market fell by 90%. It took three years. During the Great Depression, unemployment rose to 25% over that three-year period. It was brutal. <clears throat> I think the most dangerous thing that's happening right now that we have to accept is that when you shut down the economy, you're going to cause mass unemployment. The U.S. is about to get unemployment to be higher than it was in the Great Depression. Now you may say, some people may say, it's temporary, government can step in. But the level of despair of that level of unemployment is unbelievable. So I think we do have a very strong risk of a Great Depression. And I think that that my hope is, is that governments, as soon as they get through the COVID crisis, the immediate crisis, that, that they move then to reignite their economies. Think about Thailand. We're in a hot environment. We haven't had a huge amount of deaths. I think the latest numbers may be nine or 10 right now. We're in a hot environment. Hot environments seem to reduce the amount of COVID infection. And the world needs goods and services because they're not working in Italy, in, in Europe, in the US. Imagine if we could somehow get back to work, it would allow us then to start to recover from it. So there's still a chance that we can recover, but it has to happen by turning the economy back on. When that happens, I don't know. That's up to governments. Next question. Tiradon, when to change from each asset class? There is a delay to switch from one to another and miss the target price. 
is it significant to consider under the volatility situation? I think that <clears throat> you have to set your plan. Now, in, through phenomena, you can execute right away. They're going to tell you when the strategies change, and you can execute right away. I think you should follow that as best that you can. And if you're trying to do it on your own, it's difficult, and you, you just need to do it as quickly as you possibly can. All right, last question. If an investor is able to set and forget his strategy for 10 to 15 years, is then 100 <clears throat> percent equity allocation suitable? That is an excellent question. The answer is generally yes. If you could own only 100 percent equity and hold it for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, look at Warren Buffett. He held an equity position in the stock market for maybe 60 years. Yes, but most people aren't able to do that. If you can do that, I challenge you to do it, you will end up with a huge amount of money at the end. But it means that you've got to ride 50% downsides on the equity and not sell during that time. In fact, you want to contribute. If you can do that on your own, I would suggest that that's probably the best long-term strategy. But many people can't do that. And that's what we're trying to do is provide some level of risk management in that process and keep you exposed to equity. And that's what we're doing through AWS. I think that was the last question. So, I want to thank everybody for paying attention and listening and going through it. And uh, remember, if you have more questions, you can put them at phenomena.com slash ask or f-i-n-n-o dot me slash ask dash thoughts. I'm happy to take more questions and I would be happy to discuss it more, but I don't want to take up the rest of your day. So, I want to thank you again. Have a great day.